So the name of my presentation is Qual Crawl. I always do that. I always kind of stumble over it. I say call, crawl, walk, run in digital CX tech. And the reason why I got this label is because I've been with Deluxe Corporation for 13 years. So every time I talk about my story, I talk about like how I first got started and kind of evolved the program. And, and basically now today, the program is enterprise wide. There's multiple integrations and implementations and various tools that I have in my toolkit and things like that. So it really did over the 13 years go from a crawl to a walk to a run. But there's a million different ways that companies can go from a crawl to a walk to a run. Um, and I imagine probably most of you on the phone are somewhere in the middle of a walk, maybe in the middle of a run, and we're all going to sprint at this point, you know, with tech taking off. So, um, let's see, there we go, okay. Um, so how I got here is for 20 years now, <laughs> I've been in this field and leading both qualitative and quantitative research. So in UX roles and CX roles, and sometimes they really kind of blend together. But um, so like I mentioned, 13 years with Deluxe, um, still there today. And I'm a digital CX program manager and I basically still have the same role I had when I started 13 years ago. It's just that now I have staff reporting to me. I've got offshore people, I've got contractors. I've got more tools and enterprise wide, things like that. So the program has just grown bigger and bigger and bigger over my 13 years. And prior to that, I was at Target for seven years uh, as a senior UX researcher. And that was primarily working on Target.com, but also in-store experiences as well. So um, looking at the omni-channel and omni-experience for Target. And I put my LinkedIn there. I would love to connect with all of you. So go ahead and send me a, a LinkedIn request. Um, and you'll see this uh, LinkedIn URL a few more times throughout the presentation. So the first question all of you might have when you decided to attend this seminar or this webinar is, what is a digital CX tech stack? Or maybe you probably already knew, but um, here's how I describe it. It's a set of technology tools, which in today's world are usually SaaS tools now, which is subscription as our software as a subscription. So cloud-based tools that are subscription-based um, that support understanding the digital customer experiences, including um, websites and websites could be e-commerce sites. They could be marketing sites. Um, it could be web applications um, as well as digital products. And a digital CX tech stack is gonna include, you know, more than one tool. So it's gonna have mixed methodologies and a good kind of foundation or example of um, a tech stack would be um, getting qualitative uh, feedback or qualitative data from customers as well as quantitative data. And I'll talk more about those in a, a few minutes. Um, and it marries data sets through integrations. And that's kind of the power of these SaaS tools is that they have integrations and APIs. And so um, that's where the power comes in is by connecting uh, the tools to tell a greater story. And it advanced implement or an advanced um, digital CX tech stack program could have two-way integrations with some of those tools. So in other words, where one tool is sharing data with the other tool and that tool in turn is sharing data back to the other tool, depending on use, you know, it's, it's kind of, tricky when you want to be able to actually do a two-way integration, but um, there are instances where it's valuable and, and I'm doing it in a couple instances and I'll share those stories with you throughout the presentation. So why does it matter to be thinking about a digital CX tech stack? The reason why I think it matters is because um, when these tools are integrated, they can tell a, a larger customer story. I didn't put the word customer on this slide, but that's really what it is. It's a larger customer story. So it can answer the what and the why. And so therefore the sum becomes greater than, um, than the parts themselves. And when you do something bi-directionally, then it, then it really grows in power. So uh, again, you're taking full advantage of the tools that you have that your company has purchased. And um, what you might end up with is a network of, of integrations across multiple tools. So if I were to map out all the tools that I have integrated that are giving me some kind of CX or customer data, there's probably eight different tool sets that I have with multiple integrations, some just one way, some bi-directional. So it's a complex network. 
And one thing that's nice about it is that it really makes the data on silo because when you think about it, like, you know, I don't work with the web analytics, I, I partner with the web analytics team, but they're in a different department. But yet we partner so closely with regard to sharing data through these integrations that what's happening is that my data becomes accessible to them and all their partners, their data is accessible to me and all my partners. So really it, it ends up turning into a data democracy. And then Kind of ultimately, the nice thing about having a CX tech stack is that really, you know, our companies are spending a lot of money on these tools. So we're optimizing the tool set and getting the best value by taking advantage of what they do well, which is again, you know, collecting data and then being able to share those data with, with other partners. Any questions or comments so far? So let's talk a little bit about the possibilities. So, you know, the sky's the limit, really, in terms of what your CX tech stack could look like. Um, there's all kinds of methodologies. I'll throw some out here. Um, voice of customer. That's kind of the foundation of customer experience, of course. And uh, voice of customer captures sentiment and satisfaction. And I'll throw out some tool ideas in just a minute on the next slide, um, or some actual tool names. But... Um, so digital analytics um, captures behavior and revenue. And for those of you who aren't familiar with digital analytics, it's really similar to web analytics, but it's got a twist to it. Um, digital analytics will also get replay sessions and heat maps and things like that. So it has a qualitative aspect to it that allows you to understand the what of like, you know, you know, people are dropping, you know, what's happening with our funnel and where people are dropping out. But then it also gives you the opportunity to dig into why people are dropping out. So then there's web analytics. This is a classic. So you can get behaviors and revenue out of web analytics. And then there's CRM, customer relationship management, which of course captures, you know, customer, uh, the holistic customer life cycle and any data pertaining to customer throughout their, their visits to touch points. Application performance monitoring, um, which might surprise a lot of people because uh, this typically falls under IT. But again, this is kind of the example of data democracy, right? So, um, you know, some of the data shared with IT actually helps them with their troubleshooting. So uh, application performance monitoring typically tracks system legs and errors, which of course affects uh, the user experience. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second. Are there any other methodologies here that some of you can think of that I haven't captured? So with regard to tools, um, some of these tools I use, um, and I know there's more tools out there that I haven't listed here, and some of them I don't know how well they integrate. So I've just listed a couple for each methodology, but like for voice of customer, there's Qualtrics, who we have on the phone today. There's Medallia. Um, with digital analytics, there's Quantumetric, there's Content Square, both of those tools I've used. There's web analytics, um, like Adobe Analytics. This one I'm very familiar with as well. So with CRM, there's NetSuite, there's Salesforce. At Deluxe, we actually use Salesforce. There's app, app, the, the application performance monitoring. So there's App Dynamics, New Relic. I know that they both integrate well with digital analytics, for instance. And uh, anything? else jogged anybody's mind while I was talking? Any other tools or methodologies? Like what, what tools have you implemented that I might not have listed here, if any? Nothing? Okay. So um, I'll walk through, here's where the crawl crawl, walk, run comes into play. Um, I'll walk through the evolution of Deluxe's CX tech stack. And keep in mind, this again, this started 13 years ago. So 13 years ago, I started with 4C, which back then was a free tool, free voice of customer tool that I put on our websites because I had hypotheses when I first started at Deluxe that there were kind of some... Um, uh, not so user-friendly aspects of our checkout, for instance, of, of one of our e-commerce websites. And so I thought, well, you know, let's see if I can get some kind of free tool with an intercept and get some voice of customer data, which I was able to do. And then at the same time, I was sort of lucky that we had a VP that had uh, shiny toy syndrome and purchased a tool or a subscription to a tool called Tea Leaf, which is now an IBM tool, which is now 
probably getting phased out. It's a legacy tool, but that's kind of the pioneer of digital analytics. And so back then I was just getting an IP address from users who had submitted voice of customer feedback. And I would take that IP address and I'd enter it into Tea Leaf and I'd be able to watch some of their sessions. And then eventually I was able to prove out the model and then get Qualtrics. So now we have, an, you know, and soon we actually got an enterprise Qualtrics license and still have it to this day. Um, so I've got intercepts across all of my websites and, um, and then, but back then when I first got Qualtrics, again, I was doing the manual, um, getting the IP address from Qualtrics, entering it into Tea Leaf. And then at that point I was starting to do uh, some quantification in Tea Leaf as well around, you know, somebody might have made a comment in Qualtrics about having a, a problem to check out how many people were actually having that problem. Um, so using that and to do an impact quantification, so basically determine what kind of revenue opportunity we had in front of us, um, you know, if we were to fix a given error, and that was the power of having digital analytics as part of my program early on and helped me prove the value of using these tools and therefore start to uh, continue to build the implementation. And therefore, then I reached out to my Adobe partners and then we had Adobe data feeding into Qualtrics. And the benefit of having Adobe data feeding into Qualtrics is that I was able to get actual behavioral data around conversion. So I could start measuring like people who are uh, responding to voice of customer, were they actually purchasing like, were there more people who were giving high ratings for their experience uh, purchasing more frequently or at a higher AOV than those who were rating a, a poor experience on our website? So I started doing regression modeling. And um, so it was, again, the reason why I've got impact quantification highlighted is because that was really the key to the success of the program early on was being able to connect to revenue data and conversion. Um, so then we were able to move into the walk phase. So therefore, when tea leaves started to phase out, we were able to purchase a new tool called Quantometric, fantastic tool that we're still using today. And so we've got Quantometric feeding into Qualtrics. So now there's a little sideways carrot instead of a plus sign. The reason why there's a plus sign for for C in Qualtrics is because that, that was manual. Remember, I mentioned that I got the IP address and then I copied the IP IP address, pasted it in tea leaf. But with Quantometric, I've actually through a direct integration, I've got quantum metrics sending replay links directly into Qualtrics. And now quantum metric actually has, um, uh, they will play replay directly within Qualtrics dashboards. That's something that just launched literally in the last couple of months. There's, they're very excited about it. I've read about it a lot on LinkedIn, but it's actually very cool. So therefore people who are using Qualtrics dashboards can just see replay sessions right there without having to exit the tool, which is pretty powerful. Um, so also in our walk phase, we went from Qualtrics, we've got Qualtrics data feeding into Salesforce. And the way this is happening is that, um, you know, when users are filling out a survey, uh, one of the questions we ask is, would you like to be contacted by a sales representative regarding your feedback? And if they say yes, it goes right into Salesforce, a new ticket is created and, a, and an agent calls them up and says, hey, how can I help? Um, we also have Salesforce feeding into Qualtrics and the, we're using that for recruitment lists. And so how we're doing that is, um, so in, let's see, how are they? I did, so with the recruitment, so in, in surveys, in all of my surveys, the final question that I ask is, would you be interested in participating in future uh, research? And this again is for like getting a customer advisory panel list going or something, you know, that our UX researchers are tapping into for doing uh, future UX research studies. And if they say yes, there's that connection to Salesforce because some of our surveys we actually send out through Salesforce, like for instance, uh, once they've completed onboarding. And so therefore, when they indicate yes in the survey that they want to be, you know, participate in future studies, then all of their data from Salesforce goes back into Qualtrics and gets added to the directory. So therefore, in the future, we were able to do some segmentation based on, you know, size of their business or what vertical they're from or something like that. So again, powerful for our researchers at Deluxe. And then also in our walk phase, and we've got quantum metric actually feeding into Adobe. And the reason why is because quantum metric is superior at identifying errors and obstacles in users' experience. And so we've actually got that data feeding into Adobe to enhance our, our e-commerce dashboards.
now we're running. <laughs> so in our run phase, um, we've got Adobe target data that's feeding into quantum metric. So I'm actually managing and running the test and optimization program for our marketing for deluxe.com, which is our marketing website. And uh, we're running a lot of A-B tests. And the nice thing about um, having Adobe target feeding into quantum metric is that I'm able to look at the A version and the B version side by side when I'm looking at heat maps, for instance, or click maps, or, uh, you know, even when I'm comparing data uh, to see which ones are getting more engagement as well as more conversions. Also in our run phase, I've got Adobe feeding into Content Square. And by doing that with Content Square, I'm able to segment by channel. I'm able to look at um, personalization. We've got personalization running in Adobe right now. So I'm able to look at um, the personalized experience and, and see uh, for a given product, how are uh, financial institutions navigating this page versus small businesses, for instance. Um, so again, just fine tuning and deep, you know, our deep dives around customers' experiences. And then in the run phase, this is one I'm setting up right now, which is kind of tricky, but um, it's having Qualtrics data feed into Adobe Audience Manager. And how I'm doing this and why I'm doing this is because with Qualtrics, I've got intercept surveys on all of our websites, like I mentioned. And so now I'm asking a question of what audience they belong to so they can self-select whether or not they're a financial institution or an enterprise or a small business. And when they answer that question, that response goes back into Adobe Audience Manager. So therefore, we can kind of start to build up that those personaliz those personalization lists. Of course, we're purchasing lists from from third party vendors, but you know this is a way for us to be able to build up those lists internally um, and have people self select which audience they belong to. So when they come back to the website, it's tailored uh, a little bit more specifically to their needs. Any questions on all of this? This was a ton of stuff that I just walked through and pretty complicated, but happy to answer any questions about these implementations. Okay, so there's kind of there's a couple of um, nice benefits of this approach of integrating these tools, and one of them is being able to identify the what's and the why's around customer experience. And an example here is why did a customer or set of customers have a poor experience? And the solution or a solution, you know, there of course there's VOC and there's looking into the text analysis of VOC, which would get their sentiment um, and satisfaction rating. But if we pair it with digital analytics, we can actually tie it to their behaviors as well. And so here uh, we can look at replay sessions that are, that are tied to feedback. And the method for doing that is that we can have digital analytics feeding into voice of customer with that embedded link. So for every survey response, there's a link associated with it. So if somebody says, you know, your checkout really sucks. I had a problem with it. I, could, you know, I had an error and just couldn't get past it. So I abandoned them. And you read that and you think, well, what kind of error do they have? So therefore, you know, that being able to watch that replay session can help you identify exactly what error it is. And then um, voice of customer feeding into digital analytics, you can do segmentation. So behavioral segmentation, um, you know, through um, the our, my Adobe analytics partners will actually, um, uh, you know, look at um, segment by channel, for instance, and identify, you know, which channels are performing better. But by having voice of bringing voice of customer into Adobe Analytics, for instance, we're able to identify, you know, does that vary based on their, their sentiment that they rated in voice of customer? So pretty powerful. This is where we do actually have bi-directional integration at Deluxe. Another example of marrying the what with the why is in understanding, for instance, what is the difference in conversion rate between those who had a good experience versus those who had a poor experience? So again, this is voice of customer can feed into digital analytics or web analytics. So you can actually segment by sentiment, which is kind of what I was just talking about a minute ago. So you can have voice of customer feeding into um, into analytics that could be, again, digital analytics or web analytics, and really do a, a, a quantitative deep dive 
Um, or you can have analytics data going back into the voice of customer so that you can do a qualitative deep dive. So therefore, you know, if you're looking at um, conversion rates were low for people who had a poor experience, you can go back to VOC and look through that text analytics and again, dig into the why. So does anybody else have any um, examples of a what and a why that they have done in their organization? So another way that a digital CX tech stack is valuable is you can actually use these tools to literally deliver a better customer experience. So instead of just measuring, you can use it as a trigger to in turn turn around and create a better customer experience for your customers. How do we do that? Closed loop ticketing is kind of a classic case of that. So the use case being, how can we better help customers solve their issues or their questions? And we can do that through real-time ticket creation when a customer indicates they wanna be contacted. And I mentioned this one a little bit earlier because we are doing it at Deluxe. I think this was in our walk phase that we set up the closed loop ticketing. So um, we have this by voice of customer feeding into Salesforce. And uh, so it goes directly to a contact center representative who gets a ticket and then picks up the phone and um, contacts the customer back when they indicate they wanna be contacted. Another good use of this is through proactive chat. So how can we proactively help customers solve their struggles? And um, you can use these tools to trigger a chat window um, and embed replays through embedded replay sessions. And uh, so this can be done through digital analytics feeding into Salesforce. This is something that um, Quantumetric is actually very actively doing right now. So how this works is that um, Quantumetric might identify a particular problem area. Like let's say somebody had the same error twice on the cart page of checkout, for instance. So Quantumetric will have some kind of a trigger to identify that moment and they'll feed it back to Salesforce which will in turn trigger um, an intercept window that says, you know, would you like to talk with a sales representative right now? We see that you're having a problem to, um, you know, proactively identify that moment when they had a problem and intercept at that moment to help out the customer move past that issue. And then another way that I think a CX tech stack is beneficial is that it has a utilitarian purpose as well. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is like progressive profiling. So this was the example that I gave a couple of minutes ago where we have um, voice of customer data feeding directly into Adobe Audience Manager to build up our personalization program. So again, you can do this by surveying visitors to determine which audience they belong to and um, have that feedback into Adobe Audience Manager so that on future visits, when they return to your site, um, they can be fed an experience that's more tailored to their needs. And then customer recruitment, I mentioned this one a couple minutes ago too, but how can we tap into willing customers for future research? Well, you use your surveys to ask if they wanna be recruited for future research, and then you connect the CRM data so that you can do deeper segmentations. So this, you know, could be Salesforce data feeding into Qualtrics, for instance, which we're doing today. And then also another utilitarian use of um, these integrations is with performance improvement. So how can we troubleshoot slow performance, for instance? Um, we find out through application performance monitoring that there's a slow performance going on on a particular page. Well, we can do just like um, Quantumetric has replay embedded directly in the Qualtrics dashboards now, Quantumetric and probably some other tools as well could directly add um, replay sessions into application performance monitoring tools so that our IT partners can directly see what is going on to help them with their root cause analysis. And then bonus points. Um, is having voice of customer actually identify. Like you find out through voice of customer, a customer says like, 
you know, I just got a spinner on this page and I couldn't move forward. Well, then, um, you know, it was voice of customer that triggered us actually finding out about it. Then we look it up in application performance monitoring, watch a couple of sessions, do that troubleshooting. And now we've actually put together three tools. So that's kind of the extra bonus there. <laughs> so if anybody has any other examples, I'd love to hear it. Either hey, now. Kristen. Yeah, go ahead. Michelle Lesherson, I have a quick question. So do you ask? in your surveys if um, the people want to be included in research? I sure do. And um, how, what, like, what's the response? Is it, is it really high or is it, yes. you know, yeah, yes. that's what I figured. Yes. Yeah. I think people are thrilled to participate in research. It, and it's a whole different story when you send out a survey later on and say, hey, do you have 15 minutes or whatever? But, right. you know, I mean, of course, if you include some kind of gratuity, then you get a better response. But yeah, no, we get a really healthy response rate to that question. Yeah, I, fi I figured, um, especially if they've already provided some sort of uh, feedback, they're going to really be willing. So that's awesome. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And it's nice, it's nice recruiting them in this, in this way, because again, yeah. you're able to identify what products have they purchased from us? You know, what is, what is their uh, you know, what, where are they are, where are they in the life cycle of, um, you know, their relationship with us? Um, you know, what size company are they, you know, things like that. And so it really helps the research team a lot to have that kind of data. Can you remind me where you are? Um, I mean, I hate to say soliciting, but, um, when that is hitting them, like, where do they see that? Yeah. So I've got it in literally all of my surveys. Nice. And it's the, yeah. It, well, the thing is too, when you think about it, I think people like that question because mm -hmm. they think, oh, it matters. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd love to give feedback. You know, I mean, people appreciate the opportunity to feel heard. Mm -hmm. So um, I almost feel like I'm, you know, providing a good service as well. So it's in all of my surveys. It's the very last question. And uh, so for those who get to the end of the survey, they get the right. question because of course, you know, some people abandon, but I've got surveys across touch points. So any visit to a website, anytime they've had uh, a contact with a call center, um, anytime they've gone through a journey with us, you know, maybe that's an onboarding process. Maybe they've canceled a subscription with us. Um, as well as a relationship survey. That's typically where we get the NPS scores when we have our relationship survey. This is something that they would be asked once a year at most. Um, and that's kind of their overarching um, brand um, sentiment around Deluxe, you know, and their experience over the prior year uh, being a customer of Deluxe. Right. And um, sorry to hoard your time. Um, yeah, no, one keep last, going. One Plenty last of time. question about it is... Um, uh -huh. So do you think that it is setting an expectation that they will? And in fact, do you, um, everybody that says yes, do they get included in future research or um, maybe, maybe not? No, no, um, just because, well, first of all, we have thousands of people right in, in the database, which is awesome, you know, and that's good because like when we need to segment down to somebody is specifically just a payroll customer, I shouldn't say just a payroll customer, but you know, that's a smaller part of our business right now, and less customers than check customers, obviously. And so, you know, I, I need to keep collecting data because it's like, you know, at any given point, you know, I might need like 10 people um, to provide feedback on payroll. And when you consider, you know, when you recruit, you know, maybe only 5% of the people are going to respond to the recruit email, but no, not everybody is contacted. And part of the reason why I smile too is because, you know, just workload doesn't necessarily permit all the research that we want to be doing. But um, I, I might indicate, you know, I think I indicate in there that not everybody is contacted or, you know, you might not hear from us for or something. There's some language in there that just provides a caveat that, you know, somebody's not going to be picking up the phone tomorrow, you know, asking right. for your input. Yeah. Okay. Because I would, I would fear the expectation and then, mm -hmm. gosh, they never, you know, they never contacted me. But um, no, I think that's mm -hmm. um, brilliant. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other thoughts or questions? Or... Yeah. 
This is Kim. See, I'm wondering if uh, this totally impressive. I mean, I, I my brain is just spinning looking at all the integrations and the and how complex it seems at the first viewing. But I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about maybe the, the process of how you go about making the decision about which uh, kind of integration to look at. How often do you review those technologies or the platforms? Because obviously everything is changing all the time. There's new entrants. I mean, you've got some uh, brands like Qualtrics, which is, has been around forever and probably will be uh, longer than we are. But uh, just how does that process work? Who's involved? Um, how does it happen? Well, um, I, I do have some slides coming up around best practices, so that will answer some questions, but I will just start off by saying that I serve as, a, as an internal CSM. <laughs> I'm a customer success um, manager, basically within Deluxe, it's funny because once I realized that that was an actual role and I, I did the certification for CSM training last year, um, just to understand the role better. And I thought, this is exactly what I do, but internally, you know, as opposed to for a vendor. <laughs> and so really I kind of own the success of the program. So therefore I own managing all the relationships with my internal partners, with my stakeholders, with the people who are taking action, with the people who are using data. So I make sure that they're trained, that they're onboarded, that they have ongoing support. I hold office hours. Um, you know, I help. And then, oh, we do quarterly business reviews up to our general managers. And so I consult them through the process of preparing for those quarterly business reviews. I've got an outline that they fill out around, you know, tell us what you heard from um, voice of customer over the last three months. Um, you know, what kind of actions did you take over the last three months because of voice of customer? Um, what kind of action are you planning to take next quarter because of it? Um, and, um, so I think I'm only starting to answer your question. So that's a way of making sure that we keep value in the, in all of the integrations is really, it all comes through me. I'm the one who is the key stakeholder and who's basically creating it. And my role, um, is really program manager. And as program manager, I am responsible for making sure all of those integrations are successful. And if they're not, I sunset them. And I have sunsetted some because it's just not getting the value. And it's resource intensive to, to keep them up. And it's resource in intensive to make them work well, to make sure that the data, all the data that you're expecting is coming across, you're getting full data sets, you know, otherwise your data can be skewed. Um, so are these customers you're talking about the internal customers they're in marketing uh, sales service what other functional areas IT that's a, yep that's exactly right it's it's um primarily product owners market but so first of all to answer your question yes it's all internal customers um and it's primarily product owners marketers but then you can see that IT also has a big stake in it um, sales has a big stake in it. Um, and then I think, Kim, did you ask about like how I, I evaluate the tools as well? I do have a slide on that coming up so I can talk about the evaluation of the tools. Perfect. Yeah. And, and then maybe just how frequently you mentioned you've sun down uh, certain technologies. How do you determine that? I mean, it, just anything along those lines would be very helpful. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, adoption is key. Um, I remember I mentioned early on that impact quantification was, that was highlighted because that was really the key to the success of the program. That was really to jumpstart the program, but now it's, you know, impact quantification is very important, but adoption is critical. Because what I've done over the 13 years is where I started off where I was the key user of this data and I was the one doing all the analysis and delivering the recommendations, this program has scaled so big that um, I am now, I serve as, again, as customer success manager internally, I, I train people to use these tools and tools like Qualtrics and Quantumetric become more and more easy to use. These tools both are good examples of SaaS tools that um, 
that, that put a lot of importance in making their tools user friendly. So more and more people are accessing these tools themselves and I'm consulting them through the analysis of it. And um, what you'll see in a slide coming up, but I'll just say it now is that um, one thing that's really important to consider when you're doing an integration and you're considering which direction of the data that you want the data to go in, one is based on, you know, what are the use cases and how are you going to use the data? But number two is what is what do you think the adoption rate will be? So here's a good example. Like with quantum metric, I've got quantum metric data actually coming into Qualtrics and into the dashboards. And the reason why I go in that direction is because I've already got um, you know, like our marketers and our, my, and our product owners are already using the Qualtrics dashboard. And I know if I said, hey, here's another tool, I'm going to give you access to it. And yeah, go ahead and click around. They'd be like, no way, I don't have time for that. So the more that these SaaS tools are thinking about how can we actually embed the data directly into a format that users are already familiar with, that just helps your adoption rate tremendously. So those are the kinds of things you want to be considering are, you know, doing an audit of what tools people are using already. How are they accessing it? How are they making best use of it? And then like, how can you go with the flow? You know, because it's like <laughs> you want to be able to jump into their world and kind of make it. Basically, I'm just I've designed a program that's as user friendly as I can possibly make it, you know, so <laughs> kind of like the UX people at Qualtrics think about it. I'm sort of the UX person at Deluxe thinking about how can I make this, this stack as user-friendly as possible. Very good, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So we'll go into some best practices here. So secret to success, I mentioned this one already, impact quantification, really to get the program off the ground, this was key. You know, just showing financial value. And now because I'm, I, I'm one of the key, the key stakeholders of Deluxe.com, our marketing website. Um, lead generation um, conversion is important, so that's that's similar to uh, you know impact quantification in the ecom world and revenue lead generation for marketing. Um, and when you yep, go about ahead. the impact quantification, um, mm -hmm. I think you mentioned to me earlier that uh, your managers are really attuned to hearing about how much money is being wasted or how much money could be uh, reaped if only certain changes were made, right? You're talking about your own benchmark data, your own dollars, and not some other benchmark uh, example or, or that type of thing. I think it's so, so powerful to be able to say such and such number of people or percentage of uh, customers are unhappy or happy with something? And then what is the representation and cost to serve even just to, even if it's not total or representation and revenue, even if it's just the tip of the iceberg? Because now people are, are seeing, wow, you know, we have to act, right? It's, it establishes a sense of urgency. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, the business impact analysis that I do is basically comparing, um, you know, what is the conversion rate of the user set that had XYZ error? I always love throwing out the error and check out because, you know, users are so close to purchasing at that point, you know, their intent is so high for being a customer. Uh, that I want to, you know, the conversion rate of people who had XYZ error and check out is very important, but comparing that to all users and their conversion rate, and then identifying that delta. And, um, you know, because we're able to get abandoned cart value, you know, we're able to tie that back into, well, how much did we actually lose from the people who didn't convert? So, um, again, money speaks. <laughs> Uh, another another impact quantification that's actually kind of a bit, a bit more complicated is um, I did I built a regression model a number of years ago. We were getting feedback about something uh, with regard to um, an experience in e-commerce, and I was hearing it a lot in voice of customer. And I just thought I keep hearing this, and I mention it to to product owners and. Nobody seems to really be able to fix this issue because there's constraints, systemic constraints, 
um, you know, we're, we're a legacy company that has made um, acquisitions over the years. So therefore, like, you know, mapping data, customer data is not necessarily easy. But how can we identify if this if there's actually value in, in doing something like a single sign-on, for instance, which is a pretty big project. But by through this feedback I was getting through voice of customer, I was also getting the Adobe data. So I was able to identify those who had purchased versus those who hadn't purchased, who made, who had a specific comment regarding a specific part of their experience and built a regression model to identify what's the conversion rate of people who rated their experience high versus those who rated it low. And then in this model, and, and I didn't personally build the model, but I partnered with a statistician internally who built the model. It was actually kind of nice. It was a visualization. It was built in Excel and it was interactive. So therefore, you know, I could input into the model. Um, conversion rate is 6.7. Okay, well, if we increase the conversion, or I'm sorry, satisfaction was 6.7. If we increase 6.7 to 6.9, for instance, financially, what could we anticipate? And that model actually really got a lot of attention. And that's where we were able to start making some major changes to this particular experience um, because we were actually identifying that there were possible real dollars tied to it and significant real dollars because it had to do with people actually accessing their account. So um, that was that was a pretty successful use case. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah. All right. So again, I brought up this issue or this um, idea of direction quite a bit while I've been talking. Um, like, which direction do you want to go in? And do you just go one direction? Do you go both directions? Um, and I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago that one of the key things to be considering is, you know, think about what kind of established reporting you have in place already and what reports people are, are already accessing today and using. Because the more that you can just slide right into their current process, the, the easier the adoption is going to be. Um, and then it's also based on the analysis required for the use cases, you know, so, um, uh, you know, having digital analytics going into Adobe Analytics, the use cases are much different than having Adobe Analytics going into digital analytics. And um, an example of that is uh, with digital analytics going into Adobe Analytics, um, I'm, like I mentioned before, I'm actually feeding actual error data from quantum metric into Adobe so that that can be integrated into our Adobe e-commerce dashboards. Um, but Adobe data being fed into quantum metric is a little bit different in the sense that I can use the Adobe segmentation like channel segmentation for filtering within digital analytics and then looking at heat maps or something like that. So the use cases are radically different. So it's really important to identify what those use cases are and then identify, you know, which what's the best way to build out for those use cases. So for evaluating vendors, um, who do like um, one thing I should mention before I, I talk through this slide is that um, you know I imagine that all of you on this call probably have multiple tools already in house. So by no means am I saying that you know you need to you know, sink a lot of money into a program or something like that. But the best place to start is just start with whatever tools you have today. But let's say the pro your program is building to the point where you want to integrate a new methodology into your stack and you're starting to evaluate vendors that um, can support, um, you know, the use cases that you want to build out for. Um, and so you can ask as you're evaluating vendors, you know, find out who they integrate with, see if you can get some case studies, talk with other customers who have done this integration and find out what the professional services services are available, like how they support you through the process. Do they support you through consulting of the analysis? Do they support you with engineering through the process to make, you know, do they see it all the way through the data validation, things like that. And this, this was a very, this is kind of the money slide, I think. Uh, 
I learned this only very recently. I've been doing this for 13 years and I literally just learned this like in the last year that um, when you talk with vendors, you know, it's, it's about integrations, but how is it integrated is a really important question to ask. And it can be integrated. What is the technology that's used for the integration? And it can be an API or it could be a cookie. And I actually have an experience with this where one of my vendors is passing data through a cookie. And unfortunately, because it's a quantification, um, only about 25% of the data was being passed because it wasn't a true API. Um, so it just, it just didn't have the maturity to pass the data that was required. And so my, um, my plan, my vision for what I was gonna have integrated failed. I couldn't integrate because um, it was gonna be skewed data, you know, with only 25% of the data passing. So it's just not mature enough to have that integration. So true API is, is an indicator of a high maturity. Um, and I found that um, like with some SaaS tools, you know, you, you might be familiar with um, like, what's it called? Not schedules, um, you know, like with the investments, like level A, B, C, things like that. The ones that have the higher letters, letters, like, you know, they're evaluated at a much higher, like, you know, $2 billion or something like that, I think is like a schedule E or something like that. And I might have my model a little bit wrong here, but you get the point that, um, you know, with SaaS tools, they get investments and at the higher level investment, typically I found that, um, you know, the more mature a SaaS tool is, the more mature APIs they have. So that's, again, where it goes back to talking to customers who are actually doing the integration is very helpful to find out that they're successfully doing it the way that you want to be doing the integration. And a true, I found that with, again, the more mature organizations, they've got reliable APIs that they continue to actively manage. And it passes data with data accuracy. Um, and then again, you want to know which direction, like, are they passing the data to your other vendors or are they receiving the data or both? It could be both. Um, another important aspect to consider for successful program is um, uh, the, so your internal support staff and internal partners. So, for instance, you know, I've mentioned Adobe quite a bit. Um, Adobe, the, the um, web analytics team is under a different manager. And so I certainly don't have, you know, I can't delegate work to them, but here's where, you know, there's a certain degree of influence and partnership um, and sharing with them my vision and getting them on board with my vision. And once you have um, people like, I actually did have a very enthusiastic peer on the Adobe side, and he was the person who did all the implementation with launch and tagging and things like that. And he was excited to kind of solve some of these problems that I brought to him. And so um, having a strong internal partner was another key to my success. And that is the last one. Questions, thoughts. Uh, a quick question, Christy. It's Eddie Lopez. Um, the prior slide, or the one right before it, when you talked about which way does the data flow, I found is that also where you want to check, uh, you know, who's on the hook for GDPR, uh, California Consumer Protection Act, as well, and, and some of that data protection and um, the consumer requirements to forget my data or delete my data, things like that. Is that where you would kind of check to make sure? The vendor and the integration can handle that? Uh, that's a really important question. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. In our company, if somebody yeah. submits, if somebody submits a request to have their record removed, there's a whole process like because I own Qualtrics, Quantum Metric, Content mm -hmm. Square, like I have to check those tools. And then the Adobe, well, the Adobe people don't have to check their tool because they don't have, you know, um, customer data. They just have right you know, IP address or whatever, but there's no customer data. So I'm probably not answering your question. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, I was just curious if you'd run into that. Uh, we'd run into it on some with customer data. And then uh, now that I'm in financial services, it's really even more critical to understand where the data is actually going and who's housing it and where it's passing. Totally, totally. Well, here's a, here's a good example um, with digital analytics. So digital analytics is 
one that gets a lot of attention. It's one that gets audited every single year <laughs> um, for good reason, you know, um, and it, 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 you know, since I've been audited every single year for the last, you know, 10 years or whatever, it's easier for me to do it every single year. But because we're collecting um, customer data through replay sessions, we could be, I mean, we're masking most of it, but there, there might be some customer data that we collect like name and email address or something like that, but there's an encryption key and I own the encryption key and I own the governance of that encryption key. Basically, I can't give it out to anyone. But if there's somebody else who wants it, there is like a, 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 a waiver that they can sign with our IT security team and then go through a process of, you know, identifying, you know, is, is this business critical or whatever? And then they can get that encryption data so or that encryption key. But otherwise, that that particular data would never get passed to another tool. Excellent. I appreciate that. that. Yeah. yeah. No, thank that's you. That's a really that's good. good. Yeah, that's a really good point. Perfect. And, and I see in the chat as well. Thank you to, to uh, uh, somebody just sent me a quick message as well with some other thoughts on that. So I appreciate uh, everyone mm -hmm. on the call today. <laughs> yeah. What else? Any other stories? Anybody want to tell a story of what you're doing? <laughs> There's my LinkedIn again. <laughs> By all means, connect. Christy, uh, can you give us a ballpark of um, how much revenue you've influenced uh, to be captured because of the analysis you've done or how much cost you've saved or uh, likewise, um, how much, what, what's the ballpark a range of uh, how much it costs just to, to crawl? How much it costs? Oh, you're talking about like expenses as opposed to how much I've saved. The no, I had two dimensions of my my question. <laughs> so, are you wondering bragging, about what are your bragging rights to oh, financial yeah, yeah, yeah. impact? First, you of know, all? I don't know. <laughs> I've never added them all up, but I mean, any given incident has been hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm. You know. Like a recent one was performance on our checkout page because, you know, uh, you can imagine like, of course, our checkout page integrates with other tools, right? I, just like any checkout well, because you're going to tap, you're going to tap into some kind of tax program. You're going to tap into maybe an address verification program, things like that. So if you have all these third-party tools that are feeding into processing on a checkout page, um, it can really cause some slowdowns. And so... That was a big one recently. That was hundreds of thousands of dollars where there was like just a timeout error that was occurring. And again, it's like people are so motivated at this point to purchase because they're all the way down. In fact, that was the billing page. So it's the last step before purchasing, you know? And um, so you look at what those abandoned cart values are and it's like, oh yeah, you know, that, that got some attention and some performance was addressed. Um, hundreds of thousands. Of <laughs> I don't know across all the projects, but it can be, it's impactful. So you're saving time for for customers. Yes. You're saving money for customers. You're saving money for the company. You're generating more revenue for the company. So in all in all, the tools and whatever staff uh, costs uh, behind this are probably a drop in the bucket. But the tools can be kind so. of expensive eventually, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, there's a gamut of tools. Like, for instance, in the digital analytics world, there's a tool called Hotjar. I just don't know how well it integrates, but it's it's very, very inexpensive. It is a good tool. Um, it's not nearly as robust as like a quantum metric or content square. And, and again, I don't know how it integrates. That's why I didn't add it. But um, yeah. You know, so that's that's thus the crawl walk to run is, you know, proving out that business value over time so that you do uh, prove that you're, you know, generating or have the potential to generate a certain amount of revenue that then, oh, yeah, no, getting another tool that costs X, Y, Z dollars is, you know, it, there's value, you know, people see that readily, the business case is made. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. 
Cheryl, Matthew, Kathy, any comments, questions? I'll just say this really quick, uh, Chrissy. I thought that was a great presentation, especially the part about um, APIs. Um, I work a lot with um, technology um, and I work with a lot of third party vendors and they generally don't understand the maturity level that's required for a good API and, and how really integrating in any other way is so 1970s. So <laughs> it's just one of those things. I'm, I'm glad you called that and highlighted that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just amazed. Like this was a year ago. I figured that I was like, you gotta be kidding. I didn't, I never knew that. You know, <laughs> and it might be, it might be obvious to all of you, you know, it just took me a long time to figure it out, but it, it took me having two of my contractors working together to make this integration work. And after a month, they're like, we can't do this. I'm like, yeah. why, why not? You know, it's, it's, it's billed as being able to do it. And they're like, well, you know, the, it, it was pretty technical. They, they tried to troubleshoot quite a bit, but ultimately it came down to the fact that it was a cookie and not a true API. Exactly. I thought, oh my goodness. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Matthew, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. I really appreciated it, uh, Christy. It was uh, really nice to see the details around and the struggles around some of the, the integrations. I think, mm -hmm. um, I think we're kind of in the crawl and, and some of the work that I'm doing right now. And it's like, how do you know which vendor that you want to go with? You know, some of those things come to mind, you know, before you get into integration, integrating systems, which is the best vendor do you want to go with to, uh, you know, to try to give you those insights and start building it's all about data. And I think that that's what we're trying to get to, right? Give it the data to give us the insights so that we can go and take the right actions. So yeah. uh, I appreciate that. I, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts about which vendor to choose first off or <laughs> which one to go with or build the VOC first and what Qualtrics get our vote. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to, yeah, yeah, we've got Qualtrics on the, I was going to say, I'll lob it to others to respond. <laughs> oh, nice strategy. <laughs> right. Well, I was going to say, you know, from my presentation, you know who I use. So. <laughs> Does anybody else want to answer? Yeah. How did you start crawling? Anybody else on the call? to see you, Kathy. Are you based in San Francisco? Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd uh, jump in and add. Yeah. Um, thanks for, you know, oh, uh, this was interesting. Awesome. I'm a new um, joiner of CXPA and so just this year. So Deluxe, I'm in Minneapolis. So I'm like, I'll jump on that one. And so I just appreciated the insight. Um, I, I'm from Genesis. So I was curious about the omni-channel approach and voice of the customer is a big thing at Genesis, right? But I didn't hear much about voice um, and the integration. And that's obviously not probably something you own, Christy. Um, but, you know, um, I'm sure that's part of the stack that integrates with Qualtrics and all of the other tools that you're leveraging. Yes, we've had conversations with Qualtrics about it. We're just not mature enough in our organization to have that. Yeah, so that'll be, um, actually, Julie and I go way back. Hi, Julie. And so, um, <laughs> literally, if any of you, there is a company out there called Norstan. She and I cut our teeth in this world at Norstan. And so, um, it's, it's kind of comes full circle in this town, as you probably know, Christy. And so, I'll, I'm sure I'll circle around with her and get her insight. And we can talk more because we're, they're one of our business partners here at Genesis. So, Anyway, great information, and I really just appreciated the insight and some okay. of the challenges. And um, I love the part about APIs because that's exactly what we all tell our customers. Oh, it's all open. It's all APIs. And um, not always sure if everybody gets the value of what really that means, right, at the, at the end of the day. So uh, anyway, great, great information. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Michelle, did you have any other question or comment you wanted to make? No, I think it was awesome. Uh, it's uh, 
I certainly don't know the the true definition. As she was saying, most people don't know. I I I technically don't. Um, but I love hearing about it. I love hearing all the questions and answers that you can solve with that data. Um, I'm more of the the qualitative uh, researcher gal and um, putting data that I can grab from all of the other experts um, to tell a story. Uh, so I love hearing how you're actually, um, you know, answering the questions, creating the questions and answering them and, and making a huge impact. I think it's super impressive and I think you should get a raise. <laughs> That's what I told Kate. Kate this is recorded, Kate, right? You're not paying enough. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> yeah. You take that. I'm going to edit that part and send it to my CEO. Yeah, there, there's a sound bite for you. So I want to awesome. thank Christy so much. Uh, let's give her a hand. Thank you. I want to thank all. I mean, I just saw a bunch of comments roll in. So thank you. I appreciate all of your comments. That's that's wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. Please mark your calendars for March 2nd, where you have kind of a continuation on the, the similar theme of uh, tech and customer experience, where we're going to be learning about predictive analytics. And uh, I recently heard a, a presentation that uh, our guest speaker, Eric Head, made with the CXPA, one of those LinkedIn Lives. And it was just fascinating. I think it's a, a perfect carryover from what we've learned from Christy this time. So uh, this is going to be an in-person event. The location is to be announced. Uh, if you have a, any favorite location that you'd like to put forward to us, we're all ears, uh, but we, uh, we will be making that known uh, between now and then. So mark your calendar, please spread the word. Uh, anyone who's not in Phoenix, you're welcome to fly out here and join us. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great timing for it. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's beautiful in March here. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, thank you so much, Christy. It's been fantastic. Uh, very eye-opening, uh, great educational experience for us and very inspiring to see what you've been doing at Deluxe. And, uh, you know, you've been kind of a solo soldier, it sounds like, through most of this. So uh, big kudos to you for being a facilitator of uh, so a, a whole army of, of people that are using these tools and making it work and driving the customer experience improvements over there. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, I have been a solo person. That's why it's like when you guys are complimenting, I'm like, oh, this is great. Like people see the value. <laughs> As a team of one for a long time, like I just know that I'm doing the right thing. You know, you just know that you are. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thanks so much. And then just in closing, uh, if anybody wants to participate with our committee, we're a small committee. We do have a, a few other people who are um, contributing to us uh, occasionally. Uh, so for any amount of uh, contribution that you'd like to, um, to put forth, uh, Erica Parra, sorry, I've got this on a timer. <laughs> Keeps bouncing back. Erica Parra is the person to uh, contact to just say, hey, I'm interested in hearing more. Uh, so finally, uh, if you want to join the uh, LinkedIn group for CXPA Phoenix, that's a really easy way for us to uh, communicate. Otherwise, you can go on cxpa.org and, um, and sign up there. So thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in March. Uh, let's continue the conversation, though, on LinkedIn, if you'd like, because there's a perfect opportunity to post comments, things that you liked, your big takeaway, further questions. Christy's a member of our uh, Phoenix LinkedIn group too. So uh, many channels for us to continue the, the conversation and uh, uh, strengthen our network. Thanks everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Liz. You. Thanks everyone.